I am John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And he is. And I'm Yuval Lowe. I'm and in Boulder, Colorado. You guys are in Nottinghamshire. We are in Nottinghamshire, in the yeah. very heart of England. There you go. Where people all speak like this. Yes. Oh, no. oh I love that English accent. Don't you, Daphne? Uh, <laughs> no, he doesn't know. <laughs> so, what are we going to talk talk about uh, today? So, Yuval? well, we, we've been we've been thinking of talking about uh, the the transformation of of evolution, about how evolutionary thinking has been uh, changed drastically uh, over the last. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, ever since Darwin, or ever since even you know, Lamarck, or you know, Darwin's uh, grandfather, what's his name? Uh, Erasmus. Erasmus Darwin. Um, that there's been many different versions of, of evolutionary theory. And uh, one version that uh, uh, came about in the 1960s, uh, sometimes called single gene selectionism or molecular and neo-Darwinism. Molecular uh, neo-Darwinism. Uh, yeah. Gotta love that. But th that version has been at the heart of, of, of discourse because it was uh, popularized by figures like Richard Dawkins uh, in, in best-selling books uh, and E.O. Wilson. Uh, but that version of, of evolution is completely different than um, the version which has replaced it, which is uh, many times referred to as evolutionary developmental theory. Yeah. Uh, which completely contradicts almost all of the assumptions of uh, single gene selectionism. And, and, and can be strongly evidenced that there is, you know, there's absolute support for what is being argued here yeah. to, to show that these things are so. Epigenetics does actually exist, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, oh. yeah. Um, and, and, and the, the sexual or cultural selection and symbolic selection. <laughs> Yeah, but if there are the, the, selections of any kind. So you know, yeah, like but selection uh, of chocolates, you know, and they interact <laughs> exactly all and, the time. And, yeah, and and the selections, the the you, you have one selection, you have different inheritances, but we'll we'll, we'll get into that. Um, mm. oh, I'm glad. In a second, so I'm glad. The, <laughs> um, for those who will stay with us. Yes. <laughs> no, um, wake up! Wake up! <laughs> So that, I'll just shout that every now and then. Oh, yeah. No, I'll do it. No, he'll do so it. So the, uh, um, the, a, a lot of people don't realize that those are two completely different versions of evolution. And they treat evolution as if it is a one uh, a single theory. And so if... Well, they, uh, treat, um, they treat it as a law. They treat it as if it had been a standard. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But, but it, you know... It's, why bother questioning it? It's obviously true, and it's sort oh, of yeah. not, it's not obviously true, you know. Well, well, which version of it is obviously true? That's yeah. like saying no. I adhere to physics, but you know, different. <laughs> you know, you adhere to evolution, yeah, but, but what what you know are the mutations random or are they not random? Well, mm. It turns out they're not random. Are you know all sorts of questions and. Once those assumptions uh, at the heart of evolution change, everything about evolutionary arguments, the type of questions that are asked, the type of answers that are given, all of those change drastically. So, you, you know, uh, looking back at uh, the, the, there is something in the 90s that becomes, it, it becomes really big called the science wars. Yeah. Um, and the science wars uh, were uh, of, between on the one side you had post-structuralists or post-modernists on the other side you had scientific realists and uh, because this is the 90s it even starts before and continues later but uh, the people on the side of the scientific realism were promoting this single gene selectionism or, or molecular neo-darwinism theory of evolution and that was their side of the argument welcome back eugenics well, it's, yeah. So they, they, they don't they don't take it to, to that, and, and they, they would argue against that. But the arguments against them sometimes uh, uh, by the other side. Now, th this this uh, uh, science wars was so 
um, fears that the, the, the subject of sociobiology was uh, uh, proposed by, in, in a book by that name in 1975 by E.O. Wilson. Wilson, yeah. Uh, had to be rebranded it, itself. It got such a bad name that uh, it was rebranded as evolutionary psychology. And now, because of a specific version of evolutionary psychology, one that was promoted by uh, Cosmides and Tubi, and which relies also on this single gene selectionism version of evolution, it's kind of the, such a the, bad name. The Lego, Lego model of, of the universe. It's all explained yeah. in this Lego model. We use these <laughs> bricks. And, and yeah, the Swiss army knife metaphor, I think. <laughs> is the, um, so that gave, gave evolutionary psychology a bad name, even though there is evolutionary psychology as the subject of the evolution of psychological mechanisms or behavioral mechanisms. And then there's evolutionary psychology with a big E and a big P. And that refers to that specific paradigm by Cosmides and Tubi with all sorts of assumptions that today we know happen to be wrong. They could have been right. It just turned out that it's um, no, it, it, and, it's, a, it's a fascinating situation to have a discipline created throughout academia that is studying something that they'd be better off reading Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes novels. You know, they do more, well, you know, b because it is wandering off into this labyrinth where the compass is pointed in the wrong way. Yeah. You're not, you know, and time, because hindsight is, you know, 2020, you can make up. Once you put the idea of exaptation into any of these mm. models, things happen by chance that, you know, that are good for you. And there's no way of controlling that. There's, mm. there's no way of getting on top of that. Sometimes Leonardo da Vinci is born. And sometimes mutations aren't completely uh, random as well. So it's Yeah, there's, yeah. The, there's yeah, the, the randomness it becomes more and more questionable with cultural selection and various... Well, that, I mean... That's that too, but even genetic mutations, they're not random, not in size, not in uh, uh, time, not in uh, place. So the, the and <clears throat> so the, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get into the implications of that in, in a second, but the, I, 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 I want to say that, that uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, evolution is a subject where a lot more people think they know what evolution is than actually no it's it's probably just as bad as economics but those two fields for some reason anybody on the street you ask them and they're oh yeah, yeah i know evolution yeah that's that's survival of the fittest or that's you know uh, um some uh, some some kind of a basic algorithm or whatever uh, a version of it but uh many times it is this single gene selectionism uh, uh, version which uh, because everybody thinks they know it, and because very few people are aware that actually evolution has undergone a revolution, and um, it's uh, uh, the, and how, the, how how widespread is that revolution? Is that among biologists throughout the world? Is it no, so? It is. It is. Uh, uh, there, there was there was a Nature article from about maybe five seven years ago about this. Uh, um, and it was two sides of, of this, this old view of evolution arguing against the new version of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, each one gave an essay, which was a few pages long about, you know, uh, and the new evolution, the evil evil people, mm -hmm. just were so much more convincing. <laughs> it was just, and then you read the, the other side defending this gene uh, centric DNA centric version of evolution, which were completely unconvincing. So, but nature still presented it as these are two uh, things. But it it, it acknowledged that uh, the young biologists, the, the the up and coming biologists, they are all um, uh, a vast majority of them adhere to this new mm. evolutionary developmental biology uh, it's, uh, it's worth maybe, maybe making a quick footnote that, that nature and science are the two principal journals of the sciences they are they are the two big names that go back decades 
Um, yeah. So, so to be published by either one of those is a rare and precious thing. And sometimes they get it badly wrong. But most of the time, they get it but, badly right, you know. So if, if you look at a book like this, Evolution of You from the 21st century, century by Shapiro, yep. um, uh, he, he writes at the, at the end of the book, this is like the next to the last page, it says that um, he, he, he's uh, very happy that people who uh, uh, come from physics uh, are studying biology. And he says that physicists turned biologists have the additional advantage of lacking a formal education of, in the life sciences. Consequently, they have not been taught to exclude from their thinking notions previously concluded to be impossible. We can only hope that their less prejudiced backgrounds will make it easier for them to develop novel conceptual frameworks to complement the analytical and experimental techniques they are introducing. So, uh, this is a biologist saying that it's a good thing that we got people who haven't studied, you know, orthodox biology. Yeah. For example, in this book, he shows you how the DNA is a read-write system. We were always told that the DNA is a read-only system, right? Uh -huh. You're born with the, the, the DNA you'll have all your life, mm. and uh, it never changes. But you're actually scribbling. Are, you're actually scribbling on it as you go. Yeah, it's it's so. Um, it's evolving. Yeah, well, it's it, it, yeah yeah. It, it's of course a lot more rigid DNA, but uh, yeah. And he also so would show you how you have uh, mutations that. That there are certain places that are prone to mutate on the yeah. genome, right? So yeah. it's not random and where it would happen. And there are times in the animal or plant uh, life when under stress it increases the number of mutations. So it can, will it increase them in certain areas in the genome? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, now, it turns out that plant biologists, uh, uh, botanists who are doing evolutionary theory are always a step or two ahead of the ones that are doing animal evolution mm. because plants do all sorts of crazy genetic engineering that easier to see in, in plants mm. and it, uh, uh, it breaks all the regular rules about you know, the, the, the basic dogmas of, of uh, genetics that, that they we, uh, have been, have been you know, rethinking. Um, you, so you can, you can have a plant hijack uh, an insect's RNA or, or DNA. You can have all sorts of just disgusting promiscuous transfers. It's a yeah, kind well, of the, the, plant bestiality, you know, sexually. It's just disgraceful. Yeah, the, but that you know, to and suddenly you get an ad, an adaptation or acceptation or what have you. A change occurs because these things happen. The well, the, the, last time I saw it was it's a while ago that somebody was saying this caterpillar eats this stuff and it takes on board this genetic material. And yeah, so well, goes, usually, I'll it, have that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's usually okay, you, you grab genetic material from viruses. Mm, um, yeah, the, the, which, the which are the virus, yeah. Yeah, they've been described as the research and development uh, 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 department of biology. That yeah. Our mutations are a bunch of people get uh, the same virus. They all steal the same gene from that virus or the virus gene. gets embedded in their DNA. And so, um, but it's, it's already was selected for being useful for something mm. in the virus. And when we take on that, th those genes, we turn them off. So we can turn them off and we just have them as backup. We'll see what they can do when we're stressed, right? So that is when, uh, the <laughs> when we'll, we'll try them out. But the, mm -hmm. as long as we're doing good, uh, we, we, don't, we, can, we can have keep them turned off. So um, with the, the, uh, um, because we, we, we should rethink all of evolution, all of those arguments about the selfish gene or, you know, kin selection and, and uh, um, ignoring variation, saying that who, who cares about variation? We only care about uh, uh, selection, right? Because the variation is based on mutations and mutations are random. Mm -hmm. 
therefore the variation is random but it isn't that's how the variation is half the story yeah. um uh it's or, or it's a big 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 part of the story um uh, other assumptions that were uh uh used to be made is that culture is only human which is uh, uh that you know there's there's there are animal traditions yes of course uh that there's only a single currency in evolution that's reproductive success. that ignores the other currency which which is accepted by by many which is uh, uh evolvability hmm. so evolvability is knowing to evolve at the right uh, uh, rate, yeah. right speed at the right time, and the the, the uh, evolvability based arguments say that when things are good, you don't want to change. You want to do what you're doing. When things are bad, you want to increase the variation. This things are bad. Who knows? You know, this is the time to gamble. Yeah. Um, but if you evolve too quickly, you can have a you know a bad winter or two, and you can forget something it took you a million years to learn. Right. But if you evolve too slowly, then you uh, you don't you don't adapt fast enough. Yeah, so, you do need to sort of that central heating at some point along the way. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise so, you're a goner. Yeah. So the, the and air conditioning, you know, I mean, with the yeah. I, I learned about the wet bulb temperature the other week. The wet bulb mm. temperature, which is thirty-five degrees centigrade, and at this okay. point, people don't like to live it's not good for us <laughs> and there are more and more parts of the world where uh, kuwait is one of them saved from mm -hmm. iraqi aggression by the allies but it's now got places that people shouldn't really be living because yeah. it's consistently wet bulb temperature yeah yeah no it's it's yeah the the yeah the heat <laughs> here it's i mean in colorado it's hot but not not consistent yeah, and you, your humidity is down yeah, the ground. So, think, yeah. Yeah, so, so the heat is a lot more bearable than the great big fat sloppy heat that we get. You know? Yeah. Well, so yeah. Seven, Seventy degrees humidity. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like living in Florida, though. I, I, I do feel sorry. A friend of mine went out to the Scientology place in Clearwater and he came mm -hmm. back and, uh, and I said, yeah, How was it? He'd been out for eight months. And he said, It was awful. He said it was hot and then it rained and then it was hot and then it rained and then it was hot and then it rained. Well, they have two seasons. They have summer and they have February, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean that that there was water in the air. There was always oh, yeah. water coming in. And so it made it oppressive and no, it's heavy, horrible. quite literally. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. It is bad. I can't can't do that. Um but the so uh, if, if we turn to, to evolvability, if evolvability can come about through group selection. So people who believe in single gene selectionism uh, don't believe that group selection is possible. And now, what, is, what is group selection? So the, the, the question is what gets selection? And a whole group gets selected together. Do they all live together or die together? Mm -hmm. Now, um, for example, our cells are all selected together. Once we die, all our cells die, right? right. Uh, um, but the, except, except for the eternal ones. Yeah. So the uh, group selection is uh, um, is used to be considered uh, impossible uh, in starting in the sixties, and this was because the argument was that. Um, there would be genes that help the group survive mm -hmm. and those genes would be selected away so they'll be gone because the, the altruistic ones that help others will have a, a, a disadvantage compared to the ones that don't help others um and therefore group selection Oops. can't can't occur now this this argument of group against group selection means that also the genes cannot be selected as a group right now if we believe that traits are the product of um, the interaction of many genes, right, genetic networks, then those are selection on those traits would be a group selection on those genes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but since they don't believe in group selection being possible, the 
to yeah, people who mean, adhere to good. this, that's why it's called single gene selectionism, because mm -hmm. they believe that it's one gene, one trait. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a weird thing for biology to be organized there, you know? It would, it would be so, so uh, unlikely that things would turn out to be one gene, one trait, you know? How, how would that happen? But the, so historically, it's, it's sort of understood because, so for Darwin and, and for Lamarck and, and, and for a lot of people, the mother and father actually mix. Yeah. Right? So when you have a child, the, the child is a mixture of the mother and the father. But once Mendel came along and told us that there are genes, and we can get a gene from our mother or from our father, mm. and those genes don't mix. No. Then the mixture of the father and mother in the, the child was sort of was not taken to be as as uh, an actual mixture, mm. right? Because you either got your mom's genes or your dad's genes. But yeah. Now that we believe that traits are the product of genetic networks, right? And create my nose, you know, of thousands and thousands of genes had to interact. Mm. We Once you bring that, that, we can say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, once you you accept that it's multi-genes, then the father and the mother return to being actually mixed. Hmm. Because the, the the fact that the genes don't mix doesn't mean that the traits don't mix. Okay, yep. Yeah. So your mother uh, your mother's nose and your father's nose both look like your nose or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and of course it's it's an average and in their own ways. Yeah, and, and you get you get some of the genes in your father that weren't in your mother that were expressed and some that weren't expressed, right? Some that were. So it's all, it's all, it's all, uh, but the, the variation, right? The amount of difference between children, the two, the two same parents can have a number of children and the amount of difference between them uh, and that, that Darwin also believed was the right amount of difference with the right amount of variation to increase evolvability. And you, you want not too much variation, not too little variation, but one uh, uh, mechanism that, that, that came about from, from you know, evolvability considerations is having a, a timely increase in variation. The variation is very low until something different happens and then suddenly uh, the variation increases. Like drastic it's it too hot yeah or if selection changes right so uh, um now one of the assumptions of single gene selectionism but one that was also adopted by evolutionary psychology uh, with the big gene, um, uh, is that genetic evolution is slow and cultural evolution which is separate and they don't interact but that one is quick mm -hmm. But the big, the big direction of where we're going, that's the genetic evolution. That's the important one, right? So they say that one metaphor was that the, the genetic uh, evolution is the, the waves of the ocean, and then cultural evolution is the foam at the tip of the wave. Hmm. Where the wave goes, that's the genes. But the, 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 you know, there could be some variation. Another metaphor was that uh, the genes hold culture on a leash, right? So the genes are this, they, they walk around like a person and then the, the culture can go around them mm. uh, a little bit. Mm. And um, sniff their ankles. Yeah. And so because of this distinction between fast evolution and slow evolution mm. and genetic evolution, which is important, cultural evolution is not important, um, all sorts of strange uh, some, uh, uh, conclusions mm. come from that. One is that um to uh, uh that first of all that we can separate cultural and, and, and genetic evolution yeah uh and that if uh, something could have evolved in a genetic way only uh uh because it was functional it was good for something back when it evolved back when we lived in the savannah which also introduces the assumption that we lived in the savanna, uh, which there, there are arguments, you know, uh, with. Um, <clears throat> now, with evolutionary developmental biology, uh, we have a lot, lot faster evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's only a single evolution, which is both 
genetic and cultural because it was interact. Yeah. The fact that in, in like less than a century, like 60, 70 years, we domesticated foxes, uh, humans have in, in the Soviet Union, Russia, yeah. where, can, where they can do, you know, 50 year long experiments, which you cannot do in the West. Um, the civilized world. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> the, through, through selection, uh, you know, it's a strong artificial selection, hmm. but uh, uh, not Very only have we domesticated the foxes, but what we found out, uh, so this is actual genetic change, right? Of course. Yeah. And, um, and, and friendly foxes were selected for, and within a very fairly short period of time, really, yeah. uh, you got we, something like the reading of the dog from the wolf, that, that you yeah. got a creature that was now... But w w one it, thing... How did they smell? How did they smell? My dog has no nose. How does he smell? Um, so the, the, when we change the selection pressures on foxes, right? So this is the selection for being uh, friendly or tame or, or less aggressive. Uh, like what we you. saw is, is a spontaneous increase in the phenotypic variation of those foxes. Suddenly they have different colors. Some would have floppy ears. Mm -hmm. Some of them would have a curly tail. Um, all sorts of... Uh, um, so what you saw is you, you change the selection in one mode, and this is a biological mechanism that says, all right, things have changed. I don't know. If things have changed, I need to increase variation because I adopted for, uh, um, you know, for millions of years, I adopted for this, you know, mouse hunting or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now since selection changed, things have probably changed. Maybe the environment uh, uh, benefit this or that trait. So uh, um, this is a mechanism that would accelerate adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. So when things are good, you don't change phenotypically, at least, right? You, you, you can, which means that the actual animal doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do have an increase in genetic variation, but it's hidden. So it's, it's the animal is still the same. Um, but then when the situation changes, then um, suddenly this, 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 you, you see this huge increase in, in variation, which can now be selected. And is that epigenetic then? So it's, it's also epigenetic, yeah, uh, um, uh, of course, but it's, it's also genetic. So the, the, the epigenetics of some audience might want to know what, what yeah, that is. I think that'd be a good um, idea. So epigenetic uh, is, is th there's a lot of traits that are not determined by genes. Mm. So for example, your liver cell and your kidney cell or your hair cell are very, very different cells and they belong to very, very different organs or, you know, parts of your body. But they have the exact same DNA, right? Mm. There's no... Uh, or if you look at the, a, a queen bee and a worker bee, That's so those cool. are drastically different looking animals. Of course, again, no Pretty DNA. That thing that can't move and little things that fly about. The same DNA. Yeah. Right? The, the difference between them is determined whether or not they eat a certain kind of royal jelly when they're a certain phase of their development. Mm -hmm. And that determines which kind of animal they'll turn out to be. Mm -hmm. um, so the epigenetics is uh, um, it's, it's, uh, an inheritance system as well, but it is uh, um, what uh, uh, it's, it's, it's what is done with the genes. So I, you, you know about the Swedish famine, the story of you know, the beginning of epige or when epigenetics suddenly burst on the scene in the 70s because somebody had worked out numbers from the was the famine at the beginning yeah. of the 20th century? No, so I, I know the studies of the Dutch, the Dutch, Dutch? 1944 oh, uh, this, this is famine. From, this is pre-First World War that somebody looked at records that, that were from the Swedish famine. Yeah, that, that, yeah, the, yeah. Of course, in Holland, the terrible deprivations of the war. Yeah, and, and the, the, the effects on um, fetuses who were 
fetuses at the time of their mom starving in 1944 in the Netherlands, uh, and then the, the, the starving people themselves. Yeah, and there were epigenetics. And what were the yeah. changes? What, what, what had happened? Ah, so the, uh, if your mother was starving when you were a fetus, then I, I think there's a bigger chance that you will uh, um, gain weight, that you will be obese in your, in your life. Yeah. But more, more uh, uh, drastic uh, things have been found since, of course. Uh, so one uh, um, that <clears throat> if your father, this is, this is stuff from your father. Now, the, it turns out the sperm doesn't just have DNA. It has all DNA is always in a chromatin. So uh, every chromosome is in a sleeve of, that has tons of information on it. Yeah. Um, but if uh, 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 food preferences that are acquired in the father are passed to offspring, this is yes. Love in monkeys. Love gin ginger, just something dad. My mum hated it and anything <laughs> sweet. Oh, ginger too. Yeah. yeah. Love so, <laughs> um, the if your if your dad would have developed a taste aversion to ginger, uh, then you'll be easier for you to develop a taste mm -hmm. aversion for ginger, even if it's your dad. And if your dad smoked cigarettes before he uh, reached puberty, uh, his children are more likely to be overweight, which is. Look, <laughs> God, that, it's my fault now. <laughs> <laughs> you smoked cigarette before puberty, even? I, I was uh, about the same time. I was 12 when I started smoking. Okay. Well, you should have started when you were eight. Then maybe your kids would have been <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. heavier. Sorry, son. <laughs> Sorry, son. <laughs> maybe next time. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in general, the, 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 we, we, I, I think that in, in rats, we know that if the mother uh, diet, mother's diet, uh, uh, affects the children's mm -hmm. weight all their life. So, if it also in humans, which is not uh, uh, unlikely, uh, it could be that a lot of people who are very overweight are overweight because their mother just drank Coca Cola and ate junk food, is pregnant with it. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, their uh, uh, obesity is different than someone else's obesity, and it could be that. They don't can't change it. So there are some people whose obesity, can, you know, can be attributed to their behavior, but other people, <laughs> it's you know based on their mother's behavior. Now, yeah. if this was true, then it would make sense that this kind of obesity will show up in the United States first. <laughs> and uh, uh, but after is that uh, an astrological uh, determination? No, just because the junk food was more pro pro more yeah. common in the United States <laughs> at earlier time, uh, but that with time, uh, and, and we're seeing it now with obesity rates in the United Kingdom in Australia are starting to catch up to the United States as, you know, as 10 years, 20 years later. Make America great is. again. <laughs> Make <laughs> America great again. Yeah. Don't let us um, catch up with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the greatest already. So, but yeah, the, my body the, mass the, index, anyway. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now one way to, to test this would be to raise two identical twins in two different uteruses, which has been done in rats, right? So, a yeah. lot of people assume that everything that's identical about identical twins is identical because of their genes, right? They're mm -hmm. identical genetic material. But it's unclear how much is because due to their, their identities due to them having the same genes and how much of their identities due to them sharing a uterus, mm. right? For yeah. uh, uh, nine months. So- um, It's gotta get it down. <laughs> Being cramped in there for nine months and just getting worse and worse every day, you know? And, 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 and the mother's behavior today, it's completely accepted that the mother is drinking of alcohol or smoking cigarettes or doing drugs would affect the fetus. But um, why wouldn't we assume that, that you know, Coca-Cola or sugar would affect the fetus or, or stress or, or all sorts of different uh, um, uh, uh, inputs. So if we had identical twins that were raised in two different uteruses, um, 
people could, we could see how different they are. Now in rats, they're a lot more different. Mm. Uh, in humans, it's just never, it was never done. But we uh, can do it, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it can be done, of course, yeah. Let's go down, with, <laughs> let's go down with the boys from Brazil. Yeah, it, you know, I don't know how unethical it is. Uh, um, it, how unethical not, would you like how unethical yeah, have you got in the world's world? But it, it is very curious, right? Uh, it is, uh, no, uh, no, no, stop it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not promoting <laughs> experiments on humans, yeah, but not this um, week. Not yet. Don't try this so, at home. Okay. Uh, um, so the the with the uh, you know of course with a gene only type of evolution, all of this discussion of epigenetic effects uh, um, that doesn't matter because it's only it's only genes that are the replicators and huh. uh, um, but so the. the the epigenetic inheritance system is uh, uh, inheritance where one liver cell gives birth to another liver cell, the one or you know splits into two, mm. the two know to remain liver cells, right? So it needs to inherit what kind of cell that it is. Say, Bye, I'm off to yeah. be a hair. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be a kidney cell over here. Yes. You know, I'm gonna be a whatever, a skin yeah. cell. I was um, born to be different. <laughs> Yeah, and we have we have what like two hundred types of cells, I think, or so, some mm. in that order. I haven't counted um, recently. Uh, so uh, the epigenetic inheritance is just another inheritance system, uh, but it's it, there's so many epigenetic mechanisms that, mm. uh, yeah. which is so much that can be altered by my behavior that will then pass on. So as you say, the, you know, we're dealing yeah. with a read read write system yeah, that, not just a read that, system so that, that yeah that that, so yes yeah, so i can give, is, me list of, give me a list of give me a list of all the ways that i could have messed my children up and i'll see which ones <laughs> i've done it's a long list what about inhaling yeah. lead fumes because there were lots of so, them petrol when i was a child you know, that's okay. gasoline well <laughs> we, we had lead pipes in the, for our water till i was i think eight years old uh, so it's no well, it's no wonder is it you know <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah, it's it, it depends on how acidic the water is. But yeah, it's it's not it's not it's not uh, it's not very good to have yeah lead pipes. It's 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 not as bad as it sounds. Not as me. <laughs> yeah. Another yeah. thing that used to be something that, that people thought because of those assumptions about evolution was that there, you could separate na nature from nurture. Mm. Okay. So then there are natural traits and then there are nature traits, uh, natural right? Nature traits. and nurture. Yeah. Um, uh, but that distinction falls apart uh, when you don't have different types of evolution. When you just, so in the new way of thinking, you don't have genetic evolution and cultural evolution. You have genetic uh, inheritance, mm. epigenetic inheritance, cultural inheritance, as well as symbolic inheritance, mm. uh, and also you inherit real estate, um, which is not just humans, of course, right? The, the, Are you guaranteeing that I'll, I'll inherit <laughs> real estate? How much money do I have to send to you to make sure this comes true? Stop. Well, the the I know, fine for it, <laughs> So uh, the and and inheriting real estate is something that happens in the animal world. Right, beavers inherit real estate, and all sorts of animals. So it's not, it's not just us. Do they write um, wills and stuff yeah. like that too? Or? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, beaver, beaver. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's, it's beaver is much more, much more interesting than. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the just different modes of inheritance, but then those inheritance systems they all interact to. Uh, create a trait, right? Mm -hmm. So if we take a trait uh, um, like, I mean, you can have, you can do obesity, you can do others, but let's do uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, um, if you look at the inputs that go into that trait, there's major genetic inputs, right? Because if you are, uh, um, uh, there are certain populations that interact differently with alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. Asian people or Native American people. 
um, there, uh, there's epigenetic inputs, right? So if your mother drank alcohol when she was pregnant with you, you it would affect you, right? It wouldn't change your genes, but it will give you, uh, you know, through epigenetic inheritance, that would interact with your alcohol consumption. Um, but also cultural inheritance is a huge role, right? Because if you're a child Muslim or if you're a, you know, the, 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 there are populations that drink more and drink less based on cultural inheritance. Mm. Um, and there's also a, a niche in, uh, uh, like uh, 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 inheritance. So if, if the society you live in uh, um, has, you know, alcohol, uh, 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 alcoholic drink factories that, that create those, that would affect alcohol consumption. So, but at the end, you have this one trait called alcohol consumption, and that trait really affects selection a lot, right? So it affects selection based on uh, um, how are you going to live or die, right? The chance that you'll die in a, in a bar fight or as a car accident or are bigger uh, based or, or smaller based on your drinking. But also it depends, uh, it can affect how many children and with whom you'll have those children drinking right and you could also second. be so drunk during the course of an accident that you didn't die yeah all sorts <laughs> of uh, uh, they're, they're in the insane. conversation about giving alcohol to people immediately after an accident for this uh, boosting effect but i i, yeah, um, I met a guy who, what he done was, what he done was he decided it would be funny he was a little bit a little bit drunk to stick his naked buttocks out of the window of a car while driving along the highway. But unfortunately, the side swipe from the truck that went past squashed him. And the surgeon afterwards said, you were very lucky that you were that drunk. If you'd been more drunk, you'd be dead. If you'd been less drunk, you'd be dead. <laughs> so wow. it, but you have to, I think if you don't want to stick your bum out of car windows, maybe <laughs> Alcohol is not as good for you. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also maybe if you don't drink, you don't stick your hands out. Of, I've never felt inclined to yet, you know, but that could just be me. You know. There you go. Um, so the the idea is that all of those uh, uh, that trait gets selected, but when that trait gets selected for or against, uh, that does not. Uh, uh, separate what modes of inheritance, right? So it's, it's, it's that trait that affects selection and how we will be selected and, and how we're going to be, you know, we're going to make with. But, uh, um, the, the, that selection is not separate genetic selection and cultural selection, you know, it's, it's just selection. It's in um, this one complete trait. <clears throat> Um, so because they all in, uh, are so closely interacting, those modes of inheritance, you can't do the all else being equal kind of argument um, as they interact. So, the, the, so we don't have uh, uh, na natural traits and nurture-based traits. What we do have is traits where a genetic difference makes a difference or traits where a cultural difference makes a difference. But even something like reading and writing, where you would say, well, that's cultural difference that makes a difference. If you don't have the genes to create eyes and to create brains and to create memories you, and language, you don't have literacy. You know, just the fact that it's not genetic difference that affects it, but cultural difference, whether someone yeah. taught you how to read and write or not, yeah. um, doesn't mean that the that, that, uh, uh, it's just a cultural trait or that there's only a genetic trait. Um, now, initially, way back in the, the, the 70s, that the assumption was that uh, uh, genes can affect culture, but culture cannot affect genes, mm. which, is, which, is, which was a weird thing, but it was because genes change so slowly, it was assumed, right? Mm. To, 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 to make a, a, a you know, a, a, a a wolf into a poodle must have taken, you know, millions and millions of years. Of course, it didn't. Uh, uh, um, the, the, act, but, the interaction goes back about nine thousand years. Some people spoke. Yeah, about. that's that's about an. And we go, so we go from wolf to chihuahua. Yeah. 
quite easily in 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 you know probably about the first 12 years there but some time ago <laughs> the chihuahua came along yeah, yeah, yeah. and i don't know yeah. why i don't know well, why you know they're, I, they're, I, I, I was at o'hare airport in the elevator and uh, these two guys were in there with me that was it just the three of us and i'm in between them and one of them's got this comatose nude dog it's got no hair on it and looks and the like other a one, wolf embryo like the other like one, an embryo of yeah, and the otinism that the other guy looks at him and, and can you imagine this for a coincidence the other guy looks at me says oh you sedated it and he said well yeah and the first guy said they bite you if you don't <laughs> i had one and it's like there must be this magnetic attraction between people who've had one of these dogs. Yeah. Just well, like, they, they, they can be very nice and not bitey. Yes, yeah, it's just they when can. they get freaked out that, that they get bitey, I suppose. And but also, it's, it's easy to neglect small dogs because you can always pick them up. Uh, so you can neglect them and they can deteriorate. While large dogs, you need to make sure that you're, <laughs> you're, you're dealing with correctly or else you, 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 you got bigger problems. So that's yeah. why people you're have... Frightening, like, okay. You're frightening me now. Is my cat dangerous? <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you neglect it and abuse it, then it might be, yeah. Um, uh, that, I'll be very, uh, careful. Yeah, I'll be very right. careful not Fred to like. now. Then. Uh, they should put a warning label. Yeah, be, be yeah nice why isn't there a warning label sewn into a cat then? <laughs> Okay. There you go, man. Do not uh, put in microwave. That's an urban myth. My 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 thesis advisor, she she closed the door on her cat when she went to sleep, so her cat took her revenge and threw up on her laptop lap, laptop keyboard. You know, as a cat would do. <laughs> you know, so don't don't mess with cats. Uh, I never have. <laughs> Lucy Lu, Lucy's never done anything awful. You know, in, uh, in well, because you don't, yeah, you don't close the door on her. Yeah, I, um, I, I do exactly what she wants when she wants it. You know, I mean, I know which side my I, bread I, is buttered on. I stepped on her tail the other day. It just made me Ooh. evil eye. Since yeah, she gives you the evil eye all the time. <laughs> yeah. though. That's her one expression. You know, that kind of that's very uh, um, for things human. So the, the idea, uh, the old idea was that the genes could affect the culture, but the culture cannot affect the genes. Mm. But then uh, um, there were very obvious cases of culture affecting genes. For example, once we developed sign language, uh, before that, uh, deaf people um, usually uh, they, they were they, they were, uh, were very had many many troubles. Yes, you know that the people they didn't speak. They, 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 and um, many of them were in institutions, and, and uh, once uh, uh, sign language was developed, suddenly uh, deaf people became regular members of society. And when that happened, they started marrying each other mm. because they could both sign language. And yeah. uh, as a result, you had an increase of a certain genetic condition uh, that causes people to be deaf. Mm. Right? So you have a cultural dip, a change. Right? Uh, uh, sign language coming about, bringing about genetic change because now it affects selection. Hmm. But uh, um, so th there were, you know, obvious cases like that. But still, a lot of people uh, uh, were thinking that that this that genes are only genes can be the leaders. In evolution hmm. culture cannot be the leader. Uh, um, so. For example, once I was at a conference in, in Denmark with uh, uh, my advisor, Eva Yabloka, and we we're talking to this woman and she told us that language could not be responsible for how big our brains are because if you look at people with Down syndrome, they have a smaller brain, but they can speak fine, which means that uh, it doesn't require such a large brain to speak. Therefore, something else was required to, to make the, the brain grow so big. Um, so we told her, yeah, but it's not that the brain grew big to be able to, to talk. What happened was that language directed selection. So once you have selection, uh, once you have language, language determines who 
has reproduces with who, who survives and who dies. Yeah, you can't um, ask a girl out without language. No. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the people who speak well might have sex with other people who speak well. People I speak, speak well. well, and I don't have sex with other people. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking uh, about. Yeah. Uh, well, try speaking better. The, the, um, so it's not that the brain grew, right? So if you think of random mutations, you're saying that the, the, the brain grow, grew slowly through random genetic mutations. And once it was able to speak, then that was selected for, uh, but uh, uh, then the brain wouldn't grow bigger than it needed to speak. But if you think of culture, determines who selects uh, selection, right? So if, if language started out as a technology, the way literacy is today, right? Something that you learn at a certain age and you can be good or, or bad at, uh, um, but it's not yet selected for literacy. Um, then uh, uh, um, that can direct selection. And that can direct selection into a way that grows the brain bigger and bigger and bigger. But it's, 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 it's language is, is the leader, right? The culture, right? Even when it started out, when it was just the technology, it was the leader in evolution. It wasn't the follower. Mm. Um, and then things make sense. <laughs> then things, um, so for example, with the, the this evolution of, of language, um, my, my advisor, Ave Blanca, and, and uh, um, another professor, a friend of mine, uh, Daniel Do, they uh, uh, proposed that uh, the way language evolved has started as a technology, but then it was selected for. And because it was selected for, it underwent what's called genetic assimilation. And it became better at, and better at uh, developing language. We became conspicuously good at it. But we still need, you know, an uh, environment to teach us how to talk. It's just that we're really good at it. But this was already selected for. Um, and that literacy could end up like that. But in that kind of uh, story, culture is the leader, mm. not a follower. Mm. Now, um, <clears throat> so what, what are the genes? You know, what, what role do the genes left with, right? So the, uh, um, there is uh, the, one of the people, I, th I think he came up with the word epigenetics. It's uh, uh, Waddington, I think his first name is Conrad Waddington. Um, and this is in the 40s uh, and 50s maybe. Uh, but, you know, he was, uh, uh, um, once this gene, single gene selectionism came about in the 60s, his, his uh, stuff sort of uh, uh, was, was sidelined for a few decades. Mm. Uh, with now with the return of epigenetics uh, as, as a, a, a real thing, uh, he came back. But he, he has proposed a thing called the epigenetic landscape, which, which is, mm. is uh, uh, from genes to characters. And it's based on these two pictures. Okay, okay so we have, you see there's, there's the bottom picture where you have pegs connected to a canopy above it with ropes. Yep. And then on the top picture, we have the, the shape of the canopy and there's a ball rolling down the, mm. the, and it can end up in different positions. So yes. in this picture, the pegs that are connected to the ground, those are the genes. Yep. The ropes are the epigenetic uh, uh, mechanisms, right? So they, the genes and the ropes determine the shape of that canopy. Right? Yep. Now, it's a funny it's way unclear. to make a canopy, but okay. Yeah, but the relationship between the shape of that canopy and the genes is not very clear. It's, it's, mm. You can imagine that there are certain ropes that you would cut or certain genes that you can take out that would not change anything, mm. but others that would change everything. Yeah. Now, we know also that there are many genes in an animal that we can take out and nothing changes an animal, uh, which is the same mm -hmm. thing, but that's... So we as individuals are the, 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 that little ball at the top. <laughs> it's, we're, we're born up the hill and then we roll down this epigenetic landscape, which is the 
affected by our, our, our genes and, mm -hmm. and uh, epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And we can end up in different places that are de determined by uh, um, that canopy, right? There's, there's different mm -hmm. uh, uh, locations you can end up with. Say, Four you know, slots you can go down. Yeah, and that's in evolution in four dimensions. Yep. So the um, in in that kind of, of metaphor with those those genes as the pegs, then, then the relationship between us and the genes becomes a lot more nuanced and obscure, and it's unclear how how you know the, the, how much the genetic difference can be overcome by an epigenetic different right so uh, um the uh, uh we have plasticity right so the same person can be uh, uh fat or thin or muscular or or not muscular or even tall or short it depends on uh, if you if you affect uh, you know nutrition at a young age and things like that um so that plasticity can uh, uh mask genetic differences right that uh, um, and and what Waddington uh, he, he described is that you have mechanisms that increase the genetic variation without increasing the phenotypic variation. So if you look at, at flies, they're a lot more diverse genetically than they are diverse as flies. Right? You can look at ten flies that look exactly the same. In the microscope, you can look at it, they're, they're just the same fly, you know, Drosophila, what, whatever fly, but they can be extremely diverse genetically, which is surprising. So, unlike us, that because unlike some, us and chimpanzees, yeah, is that well, no, some but genes are switched off then? Well, it's 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 Active. that together they create the fly. What, uh, um, what happens is that uh, we have selection for plasticity, which is the opposite of a trait, and we have selection for traits, right? Um, plas plasticity is quite simply the ability to change. Yeah, but we uh, gave its name to material where molecules were stretched. So... Yeah, but <laughs> if, you, if you, you, you did a survey of 100 random people in... Uh, uh, which I'm in, not going to do, by the way. No, in Nottinghamshire, and uh, you, uh, you know, from very different genetic backgrounds, and you tested how strong their jaw muscles are, right? How, how hard they can bite. You might say that, find out that they're all very similar, right? Now, this similarity could be do. hiding, yeah. Yeah. could be hiding a, a, a difference because the strength of our muscles is determined both by our genes and by how much we exercise. So it could be that of those 100 people, all with the same jaw strength, uh, some got to that strength very easily with very little practice, and some had to, you know, uh, chew more, you know, put more effort into early chewing to develop that strength. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't know that there is a difference. Now, if you took those 100 people and you put them on an island, um, Let's do yeah, it. Let's, yeah. let's, <laughs> and you change everything uh, about their oh. uh, about, about their uh, their diet, right? So now the food that they can eat is is yeah. just very hard to chew food. Mm -hmm. um, then suddenly this variation, which was obscured, right? And Waddington calls them hidden variations. Mm -hmm. Up until now, if you studied uh, those people, they all have the same jaw strength. But now that every, the, the the environment change, the ones that really very easily reach this level of strength could go a lot stronger. The ones that took a lot of exercise to get to this level of strength cannot get a lot stronger. The, That's the invention of the liquidizer. Yeah, yeah well, or the cooking, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which softens things. Uh, but uh, so in that, that first generation, you will have uh, um, some people who, who could be uh, uh, develop a lot stronger jaws and those are going to survive a lot more and because of that they're going to marry mate with each other 
right? Strong jawed people now, like strong so, people. Yeah, so now the the next generation That's not true in the eight, Flintstones. Oh, in the Flintstones, yeah. No, it's, strong jawed men and so and I'm the, not the sure this is a real theory that you're giving me here now. Sorry, go uh, ahead. Strong jaws. Yeah. So the the ones that had naturally strong, right, that could reach even stronger jaws, their next generation, both their mother and their father, were the ones that had strong jaws. Now, all the people that were born before that, they had random parents. So their parents were random regarding jaw strength. But now, because the selection pressures change, uh, you can have a, a population whose all their fathers and all their mothers were the ones that were able to get stronger jobs. Mm. So because of that, and because of the way the variation of children happens, you can have some children who, are, who have even stronger jobs than their parents and some children who don't have as strong a jobs, right? they have this natural distribution. Um, means that in one single generation, because there were hidden variations, right? So these are variations which you wouldn't know if you just studied the animal, but because there were hidden variations cured by this plasticity, yeah. uh, you change the selection and that exposes the hidden variation and allows it to uh, uh, be selected for, mm. right? Now in one generation, you will have children with stronger jaws than ever now in in on a Schwarzenegger. Single, single gene that, selection that guy in the james bond movie with the yeah, yeah. yeah i mean and, and you do you do have it's called positive assortative mating right the, the steffi graf the tennis player had children with andrea agassi the tennis player and they must they might be very, <laughs> they might be you know very very talented uh at that uh but the, if you believe in single gene selectionism, right? If Richard Dawkins' uh, uh, version of evolution was true, then that population on that island would have to wait for random mutations to affect their jaw muscles. How long? How oh, long? So it's a lot you know, with epigenetics then. I'll, and, and with, with uh, plasticity and with hidden variations and with interaction between modes of inheritance suddenly evolution is a lot lot faster and um now this was selected for right so this is selection for mechanisms of evolution mm -hmm. so this can you can say that this has to be long-term selection that would select for the animals that would have the right rate of evolution not to evolve too fast not too slow mm -hmm. to have the right amount of hidden variation, um, uh, um, and, and that hidden variation grows when when things are good. All the animals stayed looking the same, but their their genetic variation increases through mechanisms. So, which in the long term, when things change, then those differences can be exposed. So, um, uh, uh, and, and you can say that the the on that islands the ones that couldn't develop the stronger jaws, those are the ones that invented cooking. <laughs> so the, 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 this is sort of, you know, that uh, this is not, not uh, uh, which changed everything, right? Mm -hmm. That's not selection of the fittest even. That's the ones that were unfit were the ones that changed the rules, changed mm -hmm. the culture so that, that things... That, that yeah, fit, fitness becomes yeah. an impossible abstraction in such a complex environment. What yeah, fits... Fit, it, you know, it, it's like it's like one of those, you know, the L. Ron Hubbard, the everything that survives is existing sort of thing. I'm going, I think I knew that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, fitness, when the environment changes, right? Because fitness yeah. is how well you fit to a certain environment. When the environment changes, you're not fit anymore. So now fit or the, the fittest are the ones that adjust your fittest, your fitness. <laughs> to the new environment in the best way so so, so uh, i mean i mean hitler's reaction to that bunker in berlin he was just unfitted to it yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. there you go mm -hmm. yeah and his dog also he and his poor dog. dog yeah i mean that's yeah, just so unfair fit. dog murderer <laughs> at the end 
uh, having not the girlfriend, having dog. married his girlfriend and shot her, isn't that right? I mean, there's uh, a did they marry? Yeah, I mean, they blood? both got, they got married the night before uh, they committed suicide. But I don't know if he shot her. I think, I think she might have committed suicide, but oh. herself. But oh, I like to think not, of him shooting. I'm not it. sure. It's more like yeah, it's, it's more like Sid and Nancy <laughs> that way. It's more uh, symmetrical. And it was yeah. his actions which caused her to shoot. Oh, how again. could you say that Hitler was to blame in any way? <laughs> <laughs> And and, and 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 Gables and his wife murdered their eight children or nine children. Yeah, terrible, um, terrible. Yeah, <laughs> not good. Uh, not that's not very selfish, uh, but, Gene. You know. That's, yeah, that was that uh, was <laughs> an, an admission of unselfishness on the uh, part of Gene. So. There you go. Um, you don't want to inflict more people like me on the world. You know. We should have said no. It's all right. The genetic mix will be fine. Don't worry. Mangler's children mm -hmm. are lovely. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, um, yeah, he, he probably survived and ran away, who knows. Um, so uh, I, I guess I guess we've been we've been talking, I've been rambling about this stuff for, for, for a while, so we could try to get a <laughs> uh, um, the, the in conclusion, the the you sometimes would hear a very weird arguments based on evolution. Mm. Um, I mean, today it's not, you know, racist arguments that used to be supported by evolution. Today we know that Strongly actually into that's the not true. Into the 1960s, we were still seeing yeah. th this racial separation as, as, as a presumed truth, that there was a sort I mean, of race. Evolution, Nazism thought of themselves as applied biology. Yeah. That, you know, uh, with time, this genocide of the, the, the races would happen anyway. We're just making it go a little faster. Helter skelter. Actually killing it. Um, so the, the, um, t today, when th there are arguments based on evolution that are wrong, mm. when you hear those arguments, that doesn't mean that all of evolution is wrong. It no, might well, be that that specific version of evolution, and there might be very, very different ways of things of thinking about evolution. Did you want to um, say a rude word about Yuval Harari on that subject? You know, just to provoke... Well, a, a yeah, word. so if Yuval no Harari... Um, you can even say uh, his name properly. That's yeah, good. or, yeah. The, uh, uh, my, my, yeah, the, the most famous person with my name. Um, Who stole the, your name. Yeah. Well, Yuval in the okay. Bible, it's... <laughs> In the Bible, it's Jubal, and it's the guy who invents music. So, yeah, like uh, Ar Ar yeah. Arco Cola or something he's called by Ron Hubbard in an obscure bulletin. Mm. Arp, Arp Cola was Arp. the inventor of music in this universe. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Saint Cecilia's <laughs> yeah. the patron saint who's breaking Paul Simon's heart, yeah. shaking his confidence. Yeah. So, so, yes, so, Yuval mm, Harari, <laughs> did you say something like that? Yuval, Yuval Noah. Noah, Noah. Oh, Noah. Well, like, like Noah. Exactly. Noah, Noah. Yeah. Noah. Oh, I like that. That's wonderful, Noah. <laughs> I wish I'd called you that. Can we change your name? Noah. Noah. Yeah. How Sorry. much would you pay me? Uh, so, if you give me three hundred pounds, just negotiating no, here. Yeah. Uh, maybe um, another offer then. You pay me. So you know, I, I only read his book *Sapiens*, right? So, so he might he might be better in other books, but in that book, uh, um, it, it's it's also a specific version of single gene uh, 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 selectionism that that commits to uh, modularism, yeah. or even what's called massive modularity, which is also completely preposterous and wrong, and, and it, it's all based. It. Yeah. So uh, um, it, it just it's just not very serious. <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, um, and there's many problems with that book, specifically *Sapiens*. But we should probably do a whole separate video about that. Oh, we can vic viciously destroy it yeah. from a future point. Because yeah. conflict um, is what drives the internet. If, if, if there's there nobody go. disagreeing with your content, then <laughs> nobody's watching. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that the, the people who disagree have already left some comments <laughs> before they turned off this video <laughs> many, a long, long time ago. 
I find it very, very pleasantly su surprising that, that we get so few dislikes. We, 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 I think we run at about 50 likes to one dislike or something, uh -huh. which I really yeah. wouldn't expect with some of the things <coughs> of one of the organizations I've been talking about. Yeah. But it means they're not coming here because they daren't. Yeah. So that, that's quite good, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, advice, it, you know, it, it, it might be better if the people who dislike your, your videos watch them. The problem is that people who would come to dislike would not watch the video. <laughs> would come ahead of time knowing that they are going to hit dislike and then they're going to. Um, oh, and they don't, they'd only come to hit dislike. So it's interesting having seen other people targeted with such campaigns. We've been up for a year. And as yet, they haven't dared watch any of the videos. They haven't taken my advice like this about how they could annoy me. You know, they mm -hmm. daren't come to the site because if they come to the site, we go, I'll just watch a minute of it. Ah. And that'd be them <laughs> falling into the fiery pit. There you go. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, also, it could be that many people who belong to Scientology only have access to censored internet. So your, your YouTube channel, I'm sure, is on the blacklist of that of that uh, uh well i mean there was a bit of a scandal around their net nanny cd which i think was back in the 90s where mm -hmm. they sent this new package of free stuff and you go there's no such thing as a free personality test <laughs> you know there is nothing free in the sales kit you know <laughs> no <Nope. laughs> but yeah free personality yeah. test mm -hmm. So what we it's what we did, isn't it? You you did one too. I I, I did it too, yeah. Oh. And I, I want to one day go and, and do it and answer all the correct answers, have them be really impressed. I, I did really <laughs> well. I, I got I must find it, but as I recollect, it was all above the that's the death line in the middle, they don't tell uh -huh. you that. And everybody is below death, Hubbard said. Yeah, so. yeah, I was I was I was We're told that I, mean, I, I was, need I need I was psychology. Right. I need the Scientology to help me out with how horribly I did in the personality. I was along the top of the graph and Linda Harrington, mm -hmm. later Linda Jones, who marked it, said that she wasn't going to mark me down. And that was in mm -hmm. January 1975. It was, it was only 10 years later that I got my hands on the evaluation manual for the Oxford Capacity Analysis, because it's not something they publish. And there mm -hmm. it was. Anybody who scores above the death line, there's something really wrong with them. You just reverse their score. Now, <laughs> this, I know, knew a psychiatrist, a wonderful woman called Betty Tilden, and she'd had clients whose daughter had gone and done a personality test. And the next thing was she killed herself as a mm. consequence of the evaluation. So knowing that whatever was good about her, was inverted yeah, but, it's, but it's also not really good because it's it's random right there's well, they're, questions they're basically, like do, they're basically do you ever telling whistle you. do you ever whistle and if that one of them is good and then yes is good and, and no is bad or the other way around the good and bad are really not related to reality in any way in that personality test so but the then fact that if, you scored well doesn't doesn't really mean much well, it, they, yeah, the discriminations of, of basic um, empathic stances, how, how you are, how you feel you're coping in the world. Yeah, but sometimes the right answer is not what you, I mean, it's just, it's just, and, and, it's just and it strange. Can, you know, for me, with a test like that, it was fun to do, you know, but mm -hmm. that, that what you've got is that you've actually just answered 200 questions to an organization you know nothing about and in, yeah, among, those, in among those questions and they don't i've never known them use them i haven't mm -hmm. got a single instance of this but you've basically got something that the CIA would take two years to collect that you've given them in an hour in terms of yeah. summing up who you are what you like what you do you know jeff bezos and, and would be wetting already. himself you know you already put in whatever <laughs> half an hour of work into yeah you've filling invested this thing so you invest in that when i filled that when i filled out the personality test i knew probably a lot more about scientology than the person who was evaluating so for me i knew that this was all bullshit. it was boring as hell to fill it up for me because 
I knew it's meaningless. I knew the answers were meaningless. The questions were meaningless. So will, for me, will, it, was just, it was just boring as hell. How, how will I ever be academic studying paleontology? <laughs> because when, when I look at people who claim to be experts, they've read, read like three or five or 10 of his books. They mm. haven't listened to hundreds of his lectures. <laughs> and until you've got the structure of it inside your head, it's so complicated. It's a Byzantine mm -hmm. labyrinth that changed every three or four years. There are concepts in it, that, it, like the rock, that it only remain as a residue in the rock slam, which is a, when the, there's mm -hmm. a fault in the e-meter, oh, yeah. basically. But the, it, it's this bizarre structure. I don't think, I think what would happen to any academic who tried to study it seriously, they'd fall asleep. And it wouldn't be the misunderstood <laughs> words. It'd be just like, I can't listen to him talking about the halatribus implants again. <laughs> or have I lived on it? Ask Lickers. Well, that, that's why scientists that would have to do that would ask a graduate student to read those books yeah. and summarize yeah. them for them. Yeah, that's. that's and those yeah. summaries, that, there's a feudal just, system of academia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, but it will take that because he left behind such a legacy of um, hypographia. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And I mean, and he transferred. I mean, does it still count that he stopped writing, though he did write Battlefield Earth and the basis of what Robert Vaughan Young would publish as Mission Earth? Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, he just talked. Yeah. So his hypographia just, and they recorded well, every fart and every uh, belch. It's all yeah. there. There's, you know, with titanium steel doors in the desert. You can hear so, spluttering uh, and farting of Ron Hubbard as he goes, I think I'll have another glass. With the pearl of epileptics, which we, we, we assume that Hubbard could have been one, uh, it depends if it's on the, the right side of your brain or your left side of your brain, is, is whether or not you, uh, how much hypographia and how, or how much speaking. But uh, uh, I mean, the tem both temporal lobes can speak, one of them can write. Uh, so for him, it, it, he probably had it in his writing uh, hemisphere, yeah. Because he did write a whole lot, actually writing. Yeah, uh, uh, sometimes it's hy hyper uh, uh, speaking instead of hyper uh, writing. Hyperlingua. Yeah. Yeah. The continuous talking. Right. Well, right. it has been a delight. <laughs> we'll switch this off and talk privately where no one can see us. Okay. Oh, I love that English accent. Don't you, Daphne? <laughs>